turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 48, church, Isaiah chapter 48, and uh, we were there last time, if you remember, and I was committed to finishing it and didn't even come close, and, but tonight we must finish it, and so if you turn to Isaiah chapter 48, we're looking at the message entitled, God Knows. The Bible teaches us that God knows, and Isaiah 48, we're going to see just how much God knows, and if you're not familiar with the God of the Bible, let me be the first to tell you that there's nothing hidden from him. The Bible says that God knows not only everything that's coming in advance, the Bible says that uh, God knows the future in advance. The Bible, 27% or more of the Bible is the future written down in advance. And uh, what's awesome about the record of humanity in history is the fact that the Bible, the God of the Bible, has anticipated even history. We look back at history to see which way to go. God writes uh, history down in advance, and it's called prophecy. In fact, he says to all of us in mankind, he says to try him and test him in this area of God knowing the future. He, he announces that by this revelation, that God knows the future in advance, that you can trust him, that he's apart from all pagan or idols, pagan gods or idol worship. He's alive and he knows the future. He's our creator. And we've been studying this in Isaiah 48. It's one of the most profound chapters of the Bible. And I'm very excited with Isaiah 48 all the way out to chapter 66 from this point on. But remember this, the Bible that you're holding in your hands tonight, church, this book that you're holding spans uh, a time period of authorship of nearly 2,000 years. 40 different authors penning 66 different books on three different continents, many of these authors never met one another. But there is a perfect, provable, scientific unity, a continuity of the Bible, whereby these various authors, various continents, over a 2,000-year period of time, speak in perfect unison regarding one central figure and that is the Messiah Christ himself. From Genesis to Revelation, the star figure of the Bible is none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the world. And it's absolutely awesome that the Bible stands out and alone from all other books. And it shouldn't surprise us. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God who at various times and in various ways in times past spoke to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, it's an amazing portion of scripture. Jesus talking about the Old Testament. Jesus is walking on that Emmaus road and uh, there were two disciples. It was on Resurrection Sunday and now it's on the late afternoon. They're going home and the Bible tells us that they were walking home to Emmaus and it says that Jesus came up alongside them and they didn't recognize him and they were talking and walking with him and uh, he said, why are you guys so sad? And they said to him, are you a stranger? Don't you know what's happened? We had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. He was amazing in word and in deed. And we had hoped that he would deliver us. But he was crucified and he's been dead. There's rumors that he's been resurrected. But, uh, you know, we fear that the worst has befallen us. And then Jesus says this in Luke 24, 25. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Notice the prophets. Isaiah is one of those prophets. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning, what? Himself. Isn't that awesome? Jesus shows up and give, gives these two guys on a walk a Bible study, and he began at Genesis and walked them all the way through the Old Testament all about himself. That is a tremendous statement. Church, listen, it's because of the Old Testament that you and I know that the New Testament's true. It's because of the Old Testament, like Isaiah that we see from Genesis to Malachi, the creation account. You would have no understanding of the creation account but by the Old Testament. It's by the Old Testament that we know why God created and how God created. I love that. God tells us why he did it. It's beautiful. It's awesome. 
The Bible tells us the very vision of God's plan. It's the Bible, the Old Testament, that tells us that it's the God of the Bible that established nations. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that it's God who has revealed himself to mankind. God interrupts man and says, I'm the one. I'm the one that's called you out of death. God initiated that. We know that from the Old Testament, it is the God of the Bible who said, I'm going to redeem mankind. And we know, of course, from the Old Testament, maybe this is one of the most important things because it encompasses all doctrines of the Bible, that it's the God of the Old Testament that says, I will tell you the future in advance. And that's called Bible prophecy. So church, last time together, we looked at several points that I'm not going to belabor, just to point them out, that God knows, and we saw in Isaiah 48, verses 1 and 2, that he knows what's in the confession. For example, he says to the house of Jacob, he says, who are called by the name Israel. Verse 1 goes on to say that, he says, I brought you forth the wellspring of Judah. Notice this. He's speaking to them who swear by the name of the Lord. Number two, they make mention of the God of Israel. But look what he says there, but not in truth or in righteousness. Verse 2 goes on to say, for they call themselves after the holy city, that is, oh, Jerusalem. You know, uh, we worship at Jerusalem, we're good. And he says, you lean on the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name, but he's rebuking them. They said, oh, we make this confession. Listen, everybody, if we just say that we belong to God, if we just say we're Jews, if we just say we worship in Jerusalem, hey, listen, we're of Israel. We know the God of all creation. We're good. The Bible here says, God says, you say these things, but not in righteousness. And we mentioned last time that people say they're Christians, but are not in action. Listen, friends and family, you know this. You know the Bible. The Bible says, makes it very clear that what we say doesn't matter to God. It's almost as though God is deaf in some ways. Now, listen, when you pray, God is listening, right? When you pray, God's listening. But, but listen, when, when we say that we know God and we do not walk with God, it's as though he's deaf to that confession. When we say we know him and walk in sin, the Bible says that we make God out to be a liar. If we say we know him and walk in this path of sin and we think that we're going to bring God with us, the Bible says no to that. So imagine for a moment if God were to be deaf for 30 days and watch my life and your life and he can't hear a word we say. This is key. He can't hear a word we say. He just watches you and I. He's constantly watching 24-7. He watches us and then at the end of the 30 days, God writes an assessment. God says, okay, I'm going to write a report on what I saw in your life. And he writes that down and then he posts your grade on the wall And that would determine if you're a Christian or not. Did you all hear me? This is true biblical Christianity, not by what we say, but does our confession match our walk? That is true Christianity. And God is saying to Israel, you can't say that you know me, and you can't say that you worship at my temple or in my city and disobey me. In fact, way back in Isaiah 29, verse 13, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, therefore the Lord has said, inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. That's what we don't want to do as a people. God knows the inside of us. We're not fooling anybody. Uh, In reality, we're certainly not fooling God. He knows everything. The second thing we saw last time is in verses 3 through 8. And the God who knows, he knows what's in the heart. He says in verse 3, I have declared the former things from the beginning. This is the eternal God who knows the future. He says, they went forth from my mouth. God has spoken them. And he said, I caused them, the people of Israel, to hear it. God spoke to the nation of Israel. And he blessed them with his presence. He blessed them with his word. Listen, uh, today... um, you know, what, what is the, uh, the value of the, the heritage of Israel? Well, much in every way, according to Paul, the apostle in Romans chapter 9 and 10. But listen, you have the Bible right now because of the Jews having preserved the word of God. Did you know that? They didn't obey it, but they preserved it. And they've been the custodians of the Bible. That's quite amazing. And to whom much is given, says the scripture, much is required, Right? And so 
God says, I spoke to this nation. I told them things even in advance. And he knows what's in the heart. He knew what was in the heart of the people. Thirdly, we saw in verses 9 through 11 that God knows what he must do. God is sovereign and God is just and God is righteous. I find this awesome and amazing though. Look at verse 9. He says, for my name's sake, I will defer my anger because judgment was due to them. He says, for, I, for my praise, I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off. Verse 10, behold, I have refrained you, but not as, refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake and for my own, uh, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. God is saying, I know what I have to do regarding the nation that I've singled out. You've been disobedient, but this is absolutely precious graciousness. God says, judgment is owed to you. I'm going to defer it. He's not going to ignore it. He's going to defer it. Remember we talked last week how he not only deferred it, but ultimately he deferred it to Christ 2,000 years ago. According to God's word, your sin and my sin was to be judged uh, by God upon us. And Jesus took that place for us who trust in him. What a, what a beautiful thing that is. And then another thing we saw last time before we had to end in the verses 12 to 15, it's that uh, God knows what the future holds. And we recognized verse 12. He says, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, and I am also the last. And this is where we ended with the push that this is the verse, the famous verse of Isaiah 48, 12, that names the name of Messiah. This is the very title of Jesus Christ himself found in the Old Testament, revealed in the Old Testament, and then again confirmed in the New. So church, we pick it up, verses 16 to 19, where God knows what we need the most. It says in verse 16, come near to me. God is speaking. Come near to me. The word in Hebrew means to take the face. I love that. Watch this. God is saying to his people, God is saying to you tonight, come near to me. Imagine uh, the Holy Spirit communicating to you that Jesus would reach down into your life right now and God is saying to the people of Israel and he's saying to you tonight, come near to me. And as the word in Hebrew means he's taking you by the face. Isn't that encouraging? I don't know what kind of day you've had today or what kind of life you've been having lately. But listen, as a believer, if, if you have been grieved by your own lack of obedience, or maybe you're not even a Christian tonight, but you know you need the love of God in your life, and you're, you're ashamed of yourself, and, and you're guilty, God would say to you tonight, come near to me. He would reach down and pick your face up off your chest. He would lift your chin, and it's God's will tonight that he would look at you in the eyes and say, come near to me, because there's something he wants to do in your life. He wants to bring about redemption in your life. Or maybe you're a Christian and he wants to bring about recovery in your life. Look what he says. He says, hear this. That word in Hebrew means to clear out the ears. So he grabs your face and picks up your head. And then he says, hear this. And it means to clear out the ears. Have you ever, uh, now I don't know, taken a Q-tip and cleaned out your ear? You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we need to be careful that we do not become dull of hearing. We become lackadaisical and and sloppy about hearing the word of God, ho-hum, about the Bible. We we carry it or uh, hold it lightly in our lives. The Bible says, watch out that you do not become dull of hearing. And the amazing word in the New Testament Hebrew, the Greek word is to have lard. The word means to have lard impacted in your ears. Is that gross? Lard is just gross, period. But can you imagine just having fat smashed into your ear? That's the word. Isn't that graphic? Pull it out. Get it out of there. And so the Lord is saying, let me lift up your head and hear this. Get this stuff out of your ear. I want to tell you something. The God of the Bible wants to speak to you. Christian, listen, tonight, God, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you to you. Now, listen, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't raise your hand. Are you a Christian tonight, but you're not sure if you're hearing from God? I want to help you with that tonight. 
God, number one, his will is that you hear from him. Number two, how does God speak? It's quite simple. It's quite simple. You say, I'm not sure if I've ever heard God speak. Well, most, by the way, most often when I hear a Christian say that, and then I begin to question them, they're, they're most often too hard on themselves. They're not realizing that God speaks in that still, small voice. And first of all, listen, if you're a Christian tonight, if you go do something wrong, I guarantee you, God will speak to you. He said, well, that's not the context I'm talking about. I understand that. I'm just making a point. If you do something wrong, trust me, he will speak to you in about three seconds. In fact, he'll even speak to you before you do it. Right? But you're wondering, no, you know, if I, I want to go sit under a tree, if I'm kneeling in prayer, if I'm, I'm driving and I'm meditating on God, I'm not hearing from him. Listen, it's that still small voice, and this is how he speaks. He uses the word of God. He uses his Bible. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said this, will use the Bible. The more that you become familiar with the Bible, the more God speaks in the moment. The more God will speak regarding your future. The more God will speak to you regarding the issue. Do I go left or right? Do I, do I marry her or do I wait? Is she the one? What do I? Listen, there's nothing that you cannot pray for. Everything's on the table for prayer, right? Everything's there. Should I buy this or buy that? Listen, take it to the Lord. Here's the amazing thing. He wants to answer you. He really does. He's saying, listen, hear this. Christians, when you pray, expect God to answer. I mean it. When you pray, when you get up, expect him to answer. Be looking for the answer. Now before, this is not even in my notes. I'm sorry, we're going down this path, but maybe God's in this right now. I want to encourage you to pray big prayers, bold prayers. I think everything I see in the Bible, God is setting it up for us to pray big. For example, Peter steps out of the boat. I love it. Jesus is walking on water. Peter sees him and says, Lord, if that's you, he wasn't sure, by the way. This is quite a, no, no pun intended, but this is quite a step of faith. Peter's in a storm with the rest of the guys, and they're in, the storm is so bad, he, they think they're going to sink and die. And Peter thinks he sees the Lord in the storm out walking on the water. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, invite me to walk out on the water to you. Now, I think that's awesome because Peter knew the nature of Jesus. Only Jesus would ask Peter to step out on the water. Did you get that? What does that mean to us? That means if God is going to be working in your life, he's going to say something to you that is radically impossible for you to do on your own or for you to achieve or for you to budget. Have you noticed when you do a budget, nothing ever works? (laughs) God, if that's you, give me the thumbs up to step out, trusting that only the Lord would have me step out of this boat. Peter steps out of the boat and he's walking on water. Peter is walking on water. And the Bible tells us that Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. And it's the shortest prayer in the Bible. By the way, you know, listen, I'm dead serious. Prayer should be short. The Bible says, let your words be few when you come before the presence of the Lord. Anybody praying long prayers in a prayer meeting is only confessing that they don't pray much alone. They're making up for lost time. Pray to the point, pray on point, pray with passion, pray with direction, and listen, and pray with expectation. Peter was sinking, and he said, Lord, help. That's a prayer for you. Lord, help. And listen, he stepped out, and he asked for a big thing as well. God, help me. And Jesus stretched out his arm and pulled him up out of the water. Listen, we need to pray big prayers because our God is big. And we need to go to him. And listen, many times we pray such remedial prayers that if God even answered it, we wouldn't know if he answered it or not because it's such a weak prayer. Pray radical, pray big, pray in faith. God is listening and he wants to answer. And so he says, come to me and hear this. Have I not spoken in secret from the beginning? I've not spoken in secret. I'm not hiding from the time that I, it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. This is a tremendous declaration of deity, but watch what's going on. And I, I'm going to want you to take notes. Everybody take notes. This is right now what you're going to want to write this down. 
This is a declaration of deity. You say, well, who cares? You're going to care in a moment. This is a, a little bit of a theological miracle, what you're about to see, and you need to appreciate it, church. It's right here in this verse, in verse 16. Notice God says, come near to me. God says that. In your notes, in the margins of your Bible, write this down, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Watch this, eleven twenty-eight. 28. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See the correlation? God says, come. Jesus says, come. Look at verse 16. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret. John 18, 20. Jesus answered him and said, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. You see the correlation? This is the one who is the I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, right? Remember that from last week? This is none other than Christ himself speaking. Look at verse 16 again. From the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. That's, that's a statement of eternity, eternalness of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Is that awesome? I love that. This is deity. I, did you like that? I hope you like that. Well, there's one more that you can ooh and awe about. Verse 16 says, and now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Who's the me? The Hebrew demands that whoever the me is, is the first and the last of verse 12. You got that? Okay, listen. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You ought to be circling God. Son, watch, and shall call his name Jesus. You ought to circle that. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. You ought to circle that. And the Lord God, you ought to circle that, will give him, you should circle that, the throne of David. You ought to circle David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. You ought to circle Jacob. Sounds like we're reading Isaiah. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. It's eternal. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit. You ought to circle that. Do you see the connection with Isaiah? Do you like that? Yes. The old is in the new revealed. The Old Testament is revealed in the new. The Holy Spirit will come upon you in the power of the highest. Circle the highest. It's a declaration of deity. Will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born, circle Holy One, will be called the Son of God. Circle that. In that Christmas announcement is packed deity and packed with the Trinity. You can't get away from it. You can't deny it. And this is the God of Isaiah 48. Absolutely awesome. Verse 17, thus says the Lord, uh, your Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who, watch, watch, teaches you to profit, who, again, leads you by the way, you should go, listen to him. Oh, that you had heeded my commands, my commandments, my instruction. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of of the sea. What a tragic statement. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. The lamentation of God. Today I was looking at that old hymn by that former slave trader and drunk, John Newton. John Newton, the slave trader drunk who came to Christ, wrote 
the great hymn, Amazing Grace. You love that song, don't you? And in one of those uh, lyrics of that great song, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home, wrote John Newton. God says, listen, I wanted to extend to you my grace. I wanted to bless your life, but you wouldn't heed my commandments. This is the lamentation of God, the parent. He's, he's weeping over Israel's rebellion. We all know this to be true, as we mentioned last week, touched on it. Any of us who have loved a friend or a, a child or whatever, uh, you know, I remember having teachers, uh, a few, you, you only get a few teachers like this, but I remember a couple of teachers growing up when I was very, very young who really loved us. I stuttered really severely uh, all my life growing up, and it wasn't until... I was about 23 years of age when God touched me in an instant, but I stuttered profusely. And I remember one teacher, Mrs. Franz, she would have me stand up on the desk and read to the class while they all laughed and busted up laughing, and she thought it was great, and I, I hated her. I mean, I, I hated her. I, I hated every, I, I tell you, you rejection, you, I don't know if you know what that's like. You listen, people talk about bullying today. Um, I got to tell you, I was bullied beyond. I, in fact, it was in, one of the, it was in the book Lisa and I wrote for uh, David C. Cook Publishers in that book. And one of the things I wrote about bullying uh, that took place in my life, um, I don't think I should repeat it publicly like this, but you can read about it in the book. The, the publisher said, I don't think you should include that in the book. That is just too nasty. And I said, no, you're going to include that in the book or I don't have anything to write about because I'm, I'm grateful for being bullied when I was a kid because now today I don't care what anybody says about anything. Yeah, does that make sense to you? I survived. And, and listen, bullies ne bullying's never going to stop. As long as there's a human heart, there's going to be bullying. So listen, we need to prepare our kids to deal with adversity. You know that? We need to teach our kids, this is what you do when somebody makes fun of you. Because I had that all my life until I was about 23 years of age. But I got to tell you, before I was a Christian, uh, the way I dealt with being rejected was, was just beating up people. I started beating people up when I was about eight years old. And that was my only way. I couldn't talk. I couldn't protect myself. So I just started beating people up. And... Uh, that's a sad thing, but that's, that's a reality. Let me tell you something. In Christ, Jesus takes hold of those things and converts them into great victory steps. So you may be here tonight saying, oh no, my life's a mess. Hey, listen, take the mess and give it to Jesus. Watch what he does with it. He takes all that stuff that would condemn us in the world and he repackages it and, and makes it a strength to us. And God says, if you just listen to me, I... I was a knucklehead. I came to Christ at the age of 19. I wish I would have come to Christ earlier. I should have listened to people sooner. And maybe you're here tonight and, and people have been telling you stuff. Oh, you ought not to do that or you should do this. And, and they're showing you scripture and word and love. You ought to listen to them. If they love you, you ought to listen to them. What to God, we had more people speaking into young people's lives today. America's youth needs parents. They need a mom and a dad to instruct them and love on them and teach them and instill into their lives. We need to take care. God says, I, I wish you would have listened. God, listen, God, people will say, oh, it's thou shalt not and thou shalt not. Oh, listen, you're focusing on the wrong part of the Bible if you think it's all thou shalt nots. God's, <laughs> how about this? Thou shalt not uh, commit murder. Because it ain't going to go well for you if you do. God's not saying to you, you know, thou shalt not so you have a rotten, miserable life. God is saying, don't play marbles on the freeway. You're going to get hurt. It's only a rebellious spirit that says, don't tell me what to do. Right? And God says, oh, if you would have just heeded my announcements and my commandments and my instruction, I love you. But, you know, we kick against them. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1, it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Leave the verse on the screen. I want to interrupt myself for a minute. 
perilous times. The word perilous here in the Greek is a word to, to plane. You know the old contractor's plane where you plane the wood down with that blade? That's the word. The Bible says, gee, hmm, listen, skeptic in the house. I don't know if the Bible's true. Well, chew on this for a moment. The Bible says in the last days, evil is going to be so prevalent that it's going to wear on people. Just like the way a contractor planes down wood. He can take a beam and make it into a toothpick. That's Satan's plan for your life. To take you who've been created in the image of God and take evil and just peel off your skin one cell at a time until there's nothing left of you but a hollowed out core of a human. That's Satan's plan for your life. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life more abundantly. But he's, listen, he announced that the enemy, the devil has come to rob you, to kill you and to destroy you. And how do you think he does it? He doesn't show up and say, I'm, the, I'm Satan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you right here, right now. He doesn't do that. He shows up. He shows up in, in a way that is very seductive or very... Uh, enticing. And I don't mean in a lewd way. I mean, that's possible. But it, Satan may come to you with his plan and he uses somebody to say, hey, I got a great business deal for you. It's really spectacular. You know what? In three months, you're going to be a millionaire. And listen, and this happens all the time to people. They, ching, ching. The Christian sees dollar signs, gets involved with some wolf, winds up losing everything. They robs them blind. And then the person comes crying to the church and says, how could God do this to me? God didn't do it to you. You saw dollar signs, you disobeyed God, and you ran down the path chasing the golden donut, or what is it? Golden carrot or <laughs> carrot gold, that golden apple, the rubber duck, whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> this happens all the time. God wants to speak, and listen, we're living in perilous times, dangerous times. And God has instructed us. Back to first, or 2 Timothy 3, verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves. In other words, whatever I want, I'm going to take it from you because I love myself more than anything else. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is always a shocker to me. Having a form of godliness <laughs> on the outside, they have a Bible. They, got, they might even have a cross around their neck. Their car is saved. There's a Christian sticker on their car window. <laughs> they have a form of godliness. They have the external trappings of religion. This is what the Bible says. Is this not incredibly accurate? having a form of godliness, but denying its power. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And from such people turn away. You know anybody like this? The Bible says don't even eat with them. Cut them off. See, that's not loving. Of course it is loving. Absolutely loving. You love God most. God says, obey me. Listen, don't let your emotions make this decision because you're going to go down a path and you're going to crash. And then God's going to say to you, oh, I wish you had heeded my commands. I wish you'd have listened. Watch out. Be wise. Verse 18, that you had heeded my commands. Look at this. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Is that beautiful? Wow. This word river, of course, is a deep flowing river. You know how it uh, you know that a river is deep when it looks like it's hardly moving. That's a deep river. And look, you guys, the next time, if we ever get a storm again, <laughs> go, go down to the beach. Go down to the wedge down in Newport. And, and I encourage, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is one of my uh, hobbies to do. Go down to the peninsula when there's a big storm. This is a spiritual lesson. It's a spiritual field trip. I'm, I'm not kidding. Go down there, park your car. You get out of your car, and if it's a good storm, you can't even see the water yet. You're, you're just park, parking. And if you know what I'm talking about, if you've been there, the ground starts to rumble. It's, it feels like a little earthquake. 
and you start hearing the ground pounding, and as you get closer, you can't even see the waves yet. You start walking out on the sound, and the, ground, the, the sand's vibrating as those waves are hitting the wedge. And why do I tell you this? You cannot stand there without feeling extremely intimidated and insignificant. You can't stand there in the face of those waves without thinking about the righteousness of God. It's like lightning and thunder. When you see such displays, it's like, wow. And God says, I wanted your righteousness to be like that of the waves of the sea. That's what God wants in your life. People who are walking with God and have that standard of righteousness, meaning that they live right before God, they're bold. They have confidence. They don't fear. They're not anxious. They have peace. They have the the joy of the Lord because they know he is with them. They've not grieved him. It's an awesome way to live. If tonight that sounds attractive to you, taste and see, and you'll see that the Lord is good. Step out and let that confidence be yours, and it is just fantastic. Imagine God speaking to you and saying to you, oh, isn't it great the peace you have? Yes, sir. Yes, Lord. It's wonderful. Thank you, God. And he says, you know why? Because I bless obedience. God loves obedience. He loves it. Especially when it's coming from the heart. God, I know that if I obey you, what you want from me is good. So I'm going to obey you because it's right for me to do that. You're God, I'm not. And you, I trust because you're telling me the right way to go. What an amazing God we have. I said it last week, I want to repeat it in case you missed it. Every time we have followed our own instructions and denied his instructions, we've gotten into trouble. Your peace would have been like a river. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah 48, very messianic chapter 48. Does it sound familiar? If you would have listened, your peace would have been like a river. If it does, Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 37. Then... As he, Jesus, was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, this is Palm Sunday, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees, wouldn't you love to have seen this, called to Jesus from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I I wish Jesus would have just said, and to show you what I mean, shh, guys, be quiet. Listen, and the rocks would have been, praise the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. J. Vernon McGee said it would have been the first true rock concert. (laughs) These stones would cry out, he said, verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city, that is Jerusalem, and wept over it, and listen to what he said, verse 42, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your, what's the word? Peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Sound familiar? Sound like Isaiah? It's amazing. Verse 19 goes on. Your descendants also would have been like the sand. Boy. And the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. How many Jews were slaughtered just under Hitler's tyranny? Six million? One million homosexuals Hitler killed? Six million Jews? Six million Christians. And that's terrible, no doubt about it. Specifically regarding the Jewish people. Think of, uh, you, know who, you know who far, uh, Hitler's antics pale in comparison? Joseph Stalin. You ever studied Stalin? It's a miracle anybody survived Stalin in Russia. Tens of thousands of Tens of millions of people, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. Unbelievable. Regarding the Jewish people, God said here, if you would have obeyed me, you would have had 
offspring, they would have covered the globe. Israel has gone from one holocaust to another because of disobedience to God. He didn't cause it. They caused it. In other words, God says, I'll, be, I'll hold the umbrella. Stay near me. Come to me. Listen, come to me. Be near me. I'm holding the umbrella. And they refused. They ran out into the wilderness. Don't do that. Disobedience always, always leads to pain and sorrow and regret. Disobedience never, never turns out well for the offender. And finally, we end with this, verses 20 to 22. God knows what the end is all about. He knows the end. I thank God he knows the end. Go forth from Babylon. The word here actually means come out. It's very interesting. You guys, you might want to mark this if you care. Verse 20. He's saying go forth from Babylon. The only amazing thing is Israel had not yet been taken captive to Babylon yet. God is speaking prophetically. The word in Hebrew means come out of, but they hadn't even been taken captive yet by Babylon. Isn't that amazing? God knows how it ends, and he tells, it, he tells us in the, in the advance. Judah is still in the south. Israel has not gone into Babylon yet. That's not going to be for about another 127 years. And yet God uses the phraseology, the words, come out from Babylon. By the way, Revelation 18, verse 4 says the same thing. Flee from the Chaldeans. That's interesting. They're not going to appear for 150 years. With a voice of singing. In other words, when time comes for me to bring you out of Babylon and flee from the Chaldeans, God is saying, when I call you out of the world, I want you to sing about it. <laughs> Declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth. Say this. God is saying, I'm going to give you the talking point. Say this. When I deliver you from Babylon in 127, 130 years, I'm writing it down in advance. This is your instructions. When you get freed from Babylon, I want you to be happy. I want you to be singing. He's telling them, by the way, you know history. You're going to come back to this land. I want you to sing about it. Watch this. And I want you to say this. The Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. That's Jacob, the nation, Israel. And they did not thirst when he led them from uh, through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. Stop right there. You, anybody recognize this, anybody? It's amazing. Watch. You guys watch me because I, you have to. Isaiah hasn't been taken captive yet. He's going to someday be captured, uh, killed. The nation's going to go into captivity. It's in the future. God looks to the future from Isaiah's perspective. He looks to the future and says, there's going to come a day when you guys are going to leave Babylon. When you leave Babylon and you come back into the land, I'm going to take care of you. God gives them the future talking points. Please get this. Look to the future based upon prophecy. And know this. I'm prophetically telling you about the future. You can be so sure about it that you'll be able to say just exactly what the Israelites said when they came out, came out of Egypt way, way before you guys. Are you following the topography of this, the timing of it? It's absolutely awesome. You will be able to say when I bring you out of Babylon and under the Chaldeans as well, he took care of us just like he did when he brought our forefathers out from Egypt. This is the God that ties it all up. Your God ties it all up. Pastor, my life doesn't make any sense. Just follow him. Amen. And if you, listen, honestly, if you told me your life, it wouldn't make any sense to me either. I don't understand it. I don't understand the things that happened in my life. I don't get it. None of us get it. I don't care if somebody tells you, oh, I know exactly what's going on in my life. They don't. They do not know. It's all of faith, every one of us. We all get to the end the exact same way. No one's got a little in route. No one's got a fast pass. No one gets a special, you know, thing, Mickey Mouse pass. No, you don't. Every one of us, we must follow God in faith. 
We must obey his word. He's going to lead us. We all go through the same fires to the level of our exposure. You may be battling cancer tonight. The person next to you is not, but they're financially crippled. It doesn't matter what the fire is. It's the same level of intensity for them. Some of you may have a life full of troubles and somebody doesn't seem to have much troubles at all. It, don't compare yourself to others. The level of fire in that Christian's life is the level of fire in your life. We all get to the end the same way. There's not multiple doors into heaven. Jesus said, I'm the door. We can't climb over. We can't go under. We go through him, the door. And we got to stop looking at other people's situation. We've got to live our lives collectively as a church family, but individually before God in the reverence of God. We need to start praying, Lord, lead me. Lord, God, uh, guide me. Lord, use me. And all of it's by faith. It's very strange, you guys, where we're at, where I'm at, this ministry, the timing of it all. Um, I don't feel old, but I'm old. People are like saying, you know, we want to talk to you. You're the, you're the older guy now. We want to get some ministry experience. And I'm thinking... <laughs> get out. <laughs> but then I look in the mirror and I go, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's like, wait, what? Yeah, we'd like to get some advice on. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, really, it's kind of funny. So, well, you know, no, 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 you don't know. What you don't know is, is we don't know what we're doing. We're just trying to follow God. We're just trying to, one day at a time, you say, well, you know, yeah, but you know this, and that worked out this way, and, and how did you know back then when this, I didn't know. I did not know. Nobody knew. We were just following him who knew. Yeah. I'm dead serious. Well, pastor, we want some ministry advice. You want it? Really? Read the book of Acts. There's ministry advice right there. <laughs> but that's, when I ask God, God, I need some advice. What do you think he says to me? He says, read. Read. Read my word. I'm, not, I'm done talking to you, Jack. I printed it. I put it in black and white. You, it's on your lap. It's right there in black and white. I'm done talking. Read it. Oh, God, if I could just have a word, just give me a word and I'll obey it. And he's saying, I've given you 56,000 verses or whatever the number is. You don't need another one. You don't even read the ones that are in front of you. Just read those. You'll be fine. Right? It's hilarious. We're almost done. Romans 3.23. Listen, hang on to your seats. The ushers lock the doors. <laughs> Hear this out. Romans 3.23. God knows the end, and he knows what we need to do. Look to him. He knows how this ends. I would, I would encourage you to get your lead from him. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word all in Greek is the word all. <laughs> Just in case you were thinking you're special. So what are we supposed to do about that? Well, hang on. Galatians 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. The Bible I'm reading out of. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Follow God. And you, will, or you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is no way for you to control your carnal appetites unless you walk in God's Word. You can go be a monk, climb a mountain, lock yourself in a room you'll find that there's evil in your head. The only way to get that out of your head is to flood yourself with the word and walk in the spirit. No other way. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And here comes the warning. You're not being bound by the Ten Commandments if you walk in the Spirit. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. And he's warning us. Adultery. You know what adultery is? Adultery is either two people having sex that are married to other people or one person in the, uh, uh, in the relationship is married. If two people that are having sex together that are not married, that's called fornication. That's the next word, fornication. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, worshiping things. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, just out of control temper, selfish ambitions, 
dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. This, uh, we get the word orgies from this. And the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice the words lifestyle, such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. God is saying this. You just heard for the last 45 minutes, God loves you and that he wants to direct your life. And you read this and you go, what? what's with that? Well, you're making a decision right now to either respond to his love so that you can live or you're going to respond to your lust so that you can die. Well, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. Then go die. You're just going to go die. You're just going to wind up killing yourself. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. Jude 1, 20. But you, beloved, building, the word is layer upon layer, yourselves up on your most holy faith, faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, by the way, keep, that's the word, do everything possible to stay rooted like a tree, yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. God loves you and he wants to lead you. Hang on, we're almost done. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, starting there. He tells us because he loves us. He wants to save our lives. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. There's a lot of people deceived today. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. This is the love of God. Such were some of you. He's speaking to the church at Greece in Corinth. Such were some of you. This is amazing because you're going to either be forced into the cultural talking points or you're going to be liberated by the grace of God. You're going to have to pick. You're going to have to pit yourself either against this world or against God. God says, I want you to live, follow my commands, and you'll prosper. And we have to choose. And we immediately break out in an argument in our minds about what's our value. Verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Final verse, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That is awesome. Church, when you go down the, the list of the works of the flesh, you might look at those things and say, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Well, okay, I did that. Well, I, I did that, but not that, not that. Do you remember Romans 3.23? All have sinned. Friends, I'm going to leave you this picture. Imagine you're climbing up a cliff, and that cliff that you're scaling up on, you're, you're scaling on not a rope, but links links, like in a chain, and you're going up, and you're pulling yourself up, and you're doing really good. You're getting pretty excited. As you approach the top, you're just about ready to be safe, and one link from the top begins to separate and pull apart. <laughs> you see it happening, and yet you have covered 10,000 links, but only one link is breaking. Which way, if that link breaks, which way are you going to go? Are you going to go up or are you going to go down? You're going to go down. If any of those sins that were listed here, works of the flesh, just entered our imaginations, the link broke. Thus, Romans 3.23, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. But that's where the saving grace of Christ comes in. God rescued me from a lifestyle that would have no doubt put me in the grave by the time I was 30. And he rescued me at 19, delivering me from the pit. I wasn't guilty of all of those works of the flesh, but a lot of them. What about you? He wants to deliver you and have you be set free. And I pray, don't end your life by hearing from God saying, oh, I wanted your peace to be like a river. I planned for you 
to have your righteousness like the waves of the sea, but you just wouldn't listen to me. I'm so sorry. I did everything I could to get your attention. Pull yourself out of your ears and draw near to God. Amen? Amen. Father, we praise you tonight. And God, your word to us is such the word of a parent. You are the Father. You are our precious Father. Tonight, Lord, maybe some of these truths from your word sting. Maybe for some here, it warns us. Maybe for some here tonight, it provokes worship because we've been delivered. Whatever the case may be, God, I'm asking you to intervene in each and every one of our lives. To the man or woman, to the boy or girl who needs your salvation tonight, friend, if that's you this evening, you say to God right now, Lord, I'm guilty. When I heard those things read, when I, when I read that, it shocked me. It took the wind out of me. Couldn't believe I was hearing them. And God, I need help. I'm scared. I'm terrified with, with the hearing of that. If that's true, I'm in trouble. Oh, friend, I know what that's like. I remember 41 years ago feeling that. Come to him. You say to him right now, Lord Jesus, I believe tonight that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead, exactly as your Bible says, to deliver me from myself and from the curse of the law which I have broken. You come to Jesus now. You say those words or you use your own words. You tell him right now, whoever you may be, God is listening. Remember, he can hear your thoughts. Talk to him now. Maybe tonight, you haven't crossed the line, but you've been thinking about it. You've had imaginations. You've had thoughts. Well, just one little thing. Or you know what? I'm going to pay her back. Or I'm going to pay him back. Maybe some rogue bozo thought like that has entered into your mind and you've entertained it for a second. You know it's wrong. You love the Lord, but you feel like a little bit justified in carrying it out. God is warning you tonight, don't do it. Maybe tonight you've been delivered like maybe many or most in this sanctuary tonight and you're saying, Lord, thank you. Woo! Lord, praise you. Then never let your lips stop praising him. Church, let's stand together and exercise that very truth right now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.